You are listening to the Thoughts from a Page podcast, which is a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. My name is Cindy Burnett, and I'd love to talk about books with anyone and everyone. While listening to my podcast, you will hear author interviews, behind-the-scenes conversations about various aspects of the publishing world, theme discussions with other book lovers, and more. For more book recommendations and a complete list of all of my interviews, check out my website, thoughtsfromapage.com, and follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Thoughts From a Page. In 2022, I would love for you to join my Patreon group. I offer at least two bonus episodes a month and a monthly advanced read and pre-publication author chat. For those on Facebook, I host a special Patreon Facebook group where we all chat books. Thanks so much to those who already participate, and I hope you will consider joining us. Today, for my behind-the-scenes series, Anne Bogle joins me to discuss her role as a literary tastemaker and influencer. Anne shares her love of the written word on her popular blog, Modern Mrs. Darcy, and on her two podcasts, What Should I Read Next? and One Great Book. She is the author of several books, including Don't Overthink It and I'd Rather Be Reading. Anne and all of her books reside in Louisville, Kentucky, sharing space with her husband, four children, and a yellow lab named Daisy. I had so much fun chatting with Anne, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks AG1 for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you wanna take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Anne. How are you today? I'm doing great because we get to talk about books. I cannot tell you how excited I am that you are here for my behind the scenes series. This is just a dream come true for me. Well, it is mutual. Thank you so much for having me. Well, you have been described as a literary tastemaker, which I love, by the way. It makes me kind of roll my eyes, but thank you. I don't know. I like it. I'm like, literary tastemaker. That's so fancy. It is fancy. And it always makes me want to reiterate. It makes me a little defensive, Cindy. I want to be like, hold on. We are firmly anti-snob. We're not telling anybody what they should read, but my team and I will enthusiastically tell you what we love and hopefully talk about it in a way that lets you decide if you might as well. Well, I think that is wonderful. You have carved such a fabulous space out in the book world, and I can't wait to hear more about it. I can't wait to talk more. Let's start with a quick snapshot of what you do, and then we can kind of go back in time and talk about how you got started and more about all of that. Sure. Well, I have a little hub that is internet-based that helps readers get more out of their reading lives. And we firmly believe that when you get more out of your reading life, your whole life is a little, sometimes a lot better. So we do that with the blog, Modern Mrs. Darcy, that's been around since 2011, which is suddenly a really long time. Yes. A podcast called What Should I Read Next? And then we have member communities for both for our What Should I Read Next Patreon and our Modern Mrs. Darcy book club. I also write books and do some, you know, other bookish stuff. But that's that's the core of what we're about. Well, I'm a patron member, and I really enjoy that community. I just recently participated with your fall reading recommendations, and it was really fun to see what you're recommending. I enjoyed the summer ones. So you really have put together quite a wonderful thing for the book world. Well, thank you. And thank you for being a part of that. And we're really looking, I mean, I know we're going to talk about what's happening in the future in my work. We're really looking even more to build up that bookish community. It's so great to find people who love books as much as you do, because I don't know about you, Cindy, but outside my work life, I don't know as many people in my bump into on the street everyday life who do love books and reading as much as I do. And it's such a gift and an affirmation to connect with people who get it. 
I think that's exactly right, Anne. And I think it's one of those things that once you know someone loves books, you can just talk forever because the conversation is truly endless. Yes, it's so true. And not only do you get to talk about the books themselves, but what I especially love about good books and about this whole space is that books are an open door to talking about all kinds of things that really matter in your everyday three-dimensional life, as well as a wonderful escape, if that's what you if that's what you need right now. I often am seeking a little of both at the same time. Exactly, especially lately. And the escape is nice because it does take you away from our current world, but it's also just a great way to visit places that I may never get to or learn about places I'd like to visit. There's just so many wonderful aspects of reading. Yes. One of my guiding lights is an out-of-context quote from Emily Dickinson, I dwell in possibility. And I love how books just dangle so many glittering possibilities in front of readers. I think that's exactly right. Well, let's back up to the beginning, to 2011, which is a while ago, and you deciding to start your blog and how you chose the modern Mrs. Darcy as your name, all of that. We actually need to go back to 2010. I think it was in that liminal space between, you know, when school lets out for Christmas and when the new year feels like it starts in earnest, when my husband, Will, and I were talking through, you know, what what went well the year before? What worked? What didn't? What do we want to do the next year? And he'd done a little bit of blogging for work in 2010. And he said, I've been thinking about blogging. I've been thinking about who should maybe start a blog. And I was like, oh, you know, somebody else at your job is going to, you know, okay, cool. Who should start a blog? And he said, you should. And I said, "Um, I don't even read blogs. This is a terrible idea. What are you talking about? But I am a persuadable type nine Enneagram. And 15 minutes later, I was like, yes, what can we call it? Ooh, the categories. Oh, like I just, my brain apparently needed to create a project to latch onto and just really ran away with the possibilities of what that could look like. And at the time, it felt like it took forever to put bones to the idea. And I'd never heard of WordPress. I didn't know anything about the techie stuff. But the first post went live in February, which I think probably doesn't exist on the internet anymore. I probably, I went through a big purge and took some old stuff down last year. But that was, that was the beginning. And how did you decide on your name for it? Well, when I started the blog, I was in my early 30s. And at the time, I didn't realize that as adults, we're just making stuff up all the time that nobody has it figured out. And I was really trying to figure out like what it meant to be an adult woman in the world today, like with all my responsibilities and all the things I wanted for my life and all the things I wanted for my work and all the things I'm a parent. So all the things I wanted for my kids, like I just felt very much like I was putting the pieces together and trying to build something. And I didn't quite know how to do it, but I knew that I wanted something. So I knew that I wanted to write in such a way that I could touch on those issues because I, I've always used writing as a way to figure out what I think, like to work out my ideas. So I knew if I was going to do this blogging thing, like I wanted it, I, I wanted to have things to explore that I felt like would be valuable and make it worth my while. So I knew that I wanted to focus on like some of those issues for today, but also I knew that I wanted to write about things that were evergreen. So I was trying to capture something, or I was trying to use a name that like captured the intersection of the timeless, like what what is always, and the timely, like what is right now. And I've always loved Jane Austen. And so I was just tossing around names and somehow hit upon modern Mrs. Darcy. And my husband was like, Oh, you could brand that. That would work. And I have had some, we've come so close to renaming it many, many times over the year. So I'm out to say we, for a long time, was just the royal we. There was, it was just me. Often pinging ideas off friends or my husband, but it was just me. But it has been Modern Mrs. Darcy for almost 12 years now. I love it because I'm a huge Jane Austen fan. So, and I think it's perfect as you're talking about the intersection of timeless and modern. So I think it works quite well. That's interesting about the renaming. That was actually one of the questions I was going to ask you, and then I had pulled it off. So I want to hear more about that. Why have you thought about maybe renaming? Oh, first of all, because there are there are so many good ideas. And I do, like, I work really well in the, the space of what could be. Like, yeah. what could we make? What could it become? Something that we say a lot in our work with our team is ideas are not the scarce resource, but there's only a few that we can implement. But the thing about naming a business is you're limited to one. So it's just always easy to think of what what could be. Also, if you have ever tried to explain modern Mrs. Darcy 
to, I don't know, someone who hasn't read a book since they graduated from high school, (laughs) real quickly, you could start to see the appeal of other names. It's a little trickier that way. On the other hand, they're not our target audience. Yes, exactly. Readers love us. And if you don't understand that, that's totally fine. It's a big internet. There's stuff out there for you too. And do you have a favorite Jane Austen? I mean, I'm assuming maybe Pride and Prejudice based on your name, but is there one that really has stuck with you over the years? I love Pride and Prejudice. Me too. My favorite rotates. So you know on my podcast, What Should I Read Next? I always ask guests to share three favorite books. And so that people aren't paralyzed by this question, we always say, they're not like your top favorite, not like your lifetime favorites, just three books you love. And I feel like that's a grace I need to give myself for Jane Austen. My usual, like, I have three that rotate through my favorite, and it often depends on the season. So in the fall, Persuasion is my favorite. In the summer, I love Emma. In the rest of the year, it's usually Pride and Prejudice. Or we could say it's whichever one I most recently read. Well, I get that. Those three are my favorites as well. I just love them. And I don't really like Sense and Sensibility, which always makes people, I think, surprised. But for some reason, that story just does not resonate with me. But I like all the rest of hers. But your three are my favorite three as well. (laughs) Well, I almost pulled Sense and Sensibility in rotation because I read it in August, (laughs) for Austin in August, which is something we've, a loose tradition we have in our book club. But I do want to say to listeners, I think because I have a blog named Modern Mrs. Darcy, I can't tell you how many times people get very apologetic very quickly, like, oh my gosh, I've never read Jane Austen. It's okay. I love her. I can give you reasons why it might be worth your while to try, but I'm not going to tell you you should. And I'm definitely, definitely not going to, (laughs) you won't get scolded for that. That's so funny. But I also think that's a wonderful thing about the book world is because there are so darn many books coming out all the time and so many that have already been published. There's a space for everything. You can read something, not read something, like something, not like something. There's just so many opinions to be had. Yes. We quote Whitman a lot too. Like we are readers. We contain multitudes. That is a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. So you started the blog and I'm assuming it took off. It may have taken some time. I know those things sometimes take a little bit of time. You started the blog. Yes, that would be an understatement. Yes, I I know. I know how those things work. So what happened after you started the blog? After I started the blog, I mean, I started it in February. It took me till April to even tell my mother. You know, a lot (laughs) of bloggers say, like, just my mom read it for years. And my mom didn't even read mine. But very quickly, I discovered that uh, my picture of what blogging would be was wrong. Like I thought blogging meant writing alone with a cup of coffee in the basement with your pajamas on because bloggers are antisocial and don't have to talk to people ever. And I very quickly realized, oh no, like the community is the best part of blogging. And this was a long time ago where like bloggers got to know other bloggers in the comment section and very quickly developed some online friends and got to know other blogs. Like I was reading blogs then or now, now I was reading blogs after not having read them the year before. And it was so fun. So the next few years just looked like slowly building up a community and figuring out what I wanted to write about. Because at first, my intention had not been to write about books. And for a long time, I'd protest when people would be like, oh, this is a book blog. And I'd be like, well, I mean, we talk about books. Now I don't protest as much, although we do talk. I mean, my favorite blog comment ever is one that said, I love how this is a place where I can find a wonderful book and a wonderful mascara because both are really important to me. And I love that this this site acknowledges that. So I very quickly discovered that something I really liked to do was to write about these issues that I felt like I was figuring out as an early 30-something through the lens of a book. I'd find I'd read something and it would get me thinking like long after I closed the book about the issue at hand. And so I ended up writing a fair number of posts saying, I was reading this book and it got me thinking about X. So these are, these are some things I'm working through. And it wasn't a post about the book, but it used literature as a doorway to conversation. And I found that I really liked those kinds of conversations and slowly started writing more about books that mattered to me because I found, much to my surprise, like, oh, hey, this is a really fun thing to write about for me and also to talk about with other readers. I was finding those conversations really valuable. And I should say right now, like there is no end game from Modern Mrs. Darcy or what should I read next? We've always tried to do good work, to make good, high quality stuff and see where it takes us. That's what I was doing then. That's what I was doing now. So I just thought, oh, I'm really liking this avenue of exploration and started leaning into that a little more. 
And so then eventually you decided to launch a podcast. Is that what came next? It did. We began, well, I began planning that in 2015. I don't know if you all remember the podcast landscape in the early 2010s, but it was a, it was trendy. Like it started to get, it started to get popular. And I had friends from blogging world who were starting podcasts. And I thought that could be really fun. But I didn't have an idea. I didn't know what I would want to talk about on a podcast. Like, I didn't want it to be the modern Mrs. Darcy show. Because we got approached a few times. Like, oh, let's start the modern Mrs. Darcy show. And I thought, I don't know. I'm exploring those topics on the blog. And I love doing that. And I can't visualize how that could be an oral conversation in a way that would make it better. Because again, ideas are not the scarce resource. Like, there are tons of new things we could try. But like, we want it to be really good. Um, And I didn't see the benefit of just doing it for novelty, although I do like novelty. And that's something I have to keep in check as as a creative person. But meanwhile, I started this blog series very early in the life of the blog that I put up spontaneously on a Sunday morning. And I called the post. This is not eloquent, but it was called Literary Matchmaking, Personal Shopping for Books, whatever you want to call it. Let's try something. (laughs) And what happened was I wrote about books on the internet. And so you... It's not uncommon for people to kind of become an authority about the thing they talk about all the time. So I got requests increasingly for people to recommend the terminology was always great books. Like, can you tell me a great book to read? And like, I'm going on a trip. Can you tell me a great book to read? And my really annoying answer was always, well, like, what what does that mean to you? Like, I can tell you what I thought a great book was, but in order to like pick a perfect book for your vacation, I need to know what you love and also what you don't, because the truth often emerges in contrast. But I spent a lot of time mulling over like what makes people think that they can ask one reader with like totally different life context, values, experiences, tastes, et cetera. Hey, tell me about a great book and to have that be a good answer. And of course, I'm writing from my background. Something else informing this experience or my, my reactions to this question was it had been really hard for me to identify my taste as a reader. Like that was a whole journey after I graduated from college to figure out what do I like as a reader and how do I go to the library and look at the end cap and go home with a book I'll actually enjoy? Or how do I do that at the bookstore? Like I just, I didn't know. And it was something I had to learn. And I could tell when people were like, oh, just like, it doesn't, don't overthink this, Anne. Just tell me, just give me a great book. You know, just a great book. I could tell that they hadn't like wrestled through those same issues. Like they hadn't really been thinking about their identity as a reader yet. And I thought, well, how can I help people do that? And how can I help people connect with books that they will find to be perfect for them and especially perfect for them right now in their lives, in their reading lives? So I said, okay, I've been thinking about this and I want to try an experiment because we believe in experimenting. I said, tell me in the comments, three books you love, one book you don't, and what you've been reading lately. And I'll recommend three books that you may enjoy reading next. And I don't know if anybody's going to bite. I don't know if anybody's interested in this idea, but maybe I'll answer a few on the blog every week and we can we can see how it goes. And I had to shut down the comments when they were like 250 oh. immediately. <laughs> and it's not like our readership was like that big. It's just that there was a lot of demand for this. And so I'd been answering these questions every Sunday on the blog for, I think, over a year at this point, maybe years, because this really started in like 2012 or 2013. The internet knows. We could actually look this up and see if memory serves. But I often found myself during that blog series a little frustrated because I wanted to ask people follow-up questions. Like they'd, they'd tell me what they enjoyed and I think, oh, well, obviously you have to read this book by Barbara Kingsolver or you have to read this book by Octavia Butler. And it was so obvious to me, I thought it has to be obvious to you too. Like surely you found this already. And I didn't want to recommend books that they had already read and loved because that's no help. I mean, you feel seen, but it doesn't help you know what to read next. And I didn't want to have a zillion email threads. Like I didn't want to have those conversations by email. So I was doing this series over on the blog on one hand. And then over here, I was having this, you know, years long thought process like, well, it'd be fun to start a podcast, but what could it be? And it took forever for me to realize like that was the same idea. But when it did, in late 2015, we started preparing to launch a podcast. And our first episode was on January 12th, 2016. And we're about to hit seven years, which just blows my mind. Like, it just baffles me. I can't believe it's almost been that long. That's truly amazing. And obviously, it really resonates with people because it has done so well. And 
anytime I mention it, everyone knows it, you know? So it's one of those things that there was a definite need for it. Well, that's so kind. And thank you for mentioning it. That's that's how people find podcasts. And we're always trying to connect. I mean, we're always trying to connect people with the right books. And we're also trying to connect with an audience who'd be excited to find what should I read next. So thank you. Well, certainly. But also, I think that the podcast works so well because different people share reads that they really like. So I can listen when I listen to your show and I hear, oh, I also really like those books or I also really didn't like that book. It's interesting to hear what you recommend and be like, oh, that's a great idea. Or I, I, you know, it helps me also with my recommendations to people as well sometimes. Well, thank you for saying that because I, I do get nervous sometimes. We ask people every week to share three books they love, one book they don't, and what they're reading lately. And we are very cautious in how we help people if they need it, like learn how to speak honestly, but also kindly and tactfully about books they didn't enjoy, knowing right. that identifying what didn't work for you as a reader is different from saying this book is trash. Like we don't, we don't say that on our show. And the reason I find that so valuable is often when, when we love something, especially if we don't like really know ourselves as readers really well, like we may know what we like, but we can't quite articulate it, which makes it very hard to walk into a bookstore and find something that you'll enjoy reading next, that the, the truth does emerge in context. And it's often only when we do find an author doing something that gets on our nerves. It's not good. It's not bad. We just, it's not to our taste. And that's fine. That's a different thing from it being quality or not quality. That's just a personal, often a personality thing. But we may not realize what we love until we encounter something we don't. And it's only then that we can go, oh, I don't like books that are largely character driven, where like the words are really beautiful. Like I need something to happen in my books. And this one was so boring. Where another reader can be like, oh, I could read evocative descriptions of atmospheric, moody, blah, blah, blah. Like I could read that for ye like for days. It never gets boring to me. And it's only when you realize those are two different options and one works for you and one doesn't that you're really able to articulate this is something important about me as a reader. So that's why we that's why we ask that. And we always try to be kind and gentle and say like we're we're talking about books we don't enjoy for a purpose. That's not how most podcasts work and ours is different and I think it's different for good reason, but we always want to be kind and respectful even as we're trying to help we're trying to help readers like connect with books they love and it's really important to acknowledge that not every book works for every reader or you can't find the stuff that does really work for you but i think your point is well taken because that's something that's taken me a little while to make sure i understand and it's important to make those distinctions when you're talking about books that you didn't like it's not that the book is bad it's just that the book didn't work for me and it didn't work for me because I was looking for something different, as you were describing. Like for me, I don't really like domestic thrillers. I don't like the mistress. I don't like the husband and wife, you know, having all this trouble. Like to me, that's just not my genre. Doesn't mean it's a bad genre. It just means it's most likely not going to appeal to me. And I think it's exactly what you're talking about, learning yourself, but also making sure you practice kindness because someone has put a ton of effort into the book that they've put out there. Yeah. And we really want to respect that. Right. And also, we exist to help readers connect with books that they love. So, Cindy, if you were on What Should I Read Next, depending on how you're feeling about your reading life and what you're looking for and what's niggling at you, we might spend some time exploring, like, okay, let's evaluate why these domestic thrillers aren't working for you. Maybe it bothers you. Maybe you're like, oh, it's so close to these other books I like, so I can't figure out why this doesn't work for me. Or maybe we just use that as a clue to go, like, domestic thrillers? Okay. Not going to approach those. Maybe you want to try one again in five years. Maybe you don't. But let's focus on what would bring you great satisfaction in your books right now. I just love that. I think it must really help readers try to narrow down for themselves what it is they're looking for so that when they go into a bookstore or the library or wherever, they have a much better sense of themselves and what's going to work. Because there are so many books out there and you hate to waste your time on the ones that aren't going to work for you. True. And we're definitely, we're not seeking to give readers a checklist like, oh, you can never, <laughs> somehow I'm thinking of Color Me Beautiful. You're a spring. You can never wear brown again. But <laughs> it's not like that at all. What we are trying to do is give you a language to think about books as you're deciding what to read next. I like that. Thank you. Well, talking about your personal reading, one, how do books make it onto your radar at all? I mean, you're reading, I know, far ahead as I am, probably even farther ahead than I often am. But how do you get books onto your list? How do you prioritize them? How do you organize your list? What does all of that look like for you? 
Oh, Cindy, I feel like those are the kinds of questions only an organized person would ask. <laughs> yes, I try to be, and I'm always looking for a better organizational system than I have. I will say it's an art and a science with a whole lot of whim and maybe whimsy <laughs> and luck thrown in. I am in the mostly fortunate position of having like literally thousands of people sometimes email me or pinging me saying like, Anne, I heard about this book and it has your name on it. I also do things like I read uh, like trade publications that are talking about books coming out sometimes next month, sometimes next year. I read like the deal points memos that say, oh, Celeste Ng just signed for three books coming out through the year 2027. So I do. I have a spreadsheet called Books on the Way and just track those little random notes. This is, oh, an author I love has a book coming out in four years. Don't forget, circle back on this later. One of my favorite ways to get great book recommendations is from independent booksellers who also have reason to read ahead. Like you, Just like you get to know a good friend's reading taste, you get to know the reading taste of people in your line of work. I'm not an independent bookseller, but we all are trying to find good books to connect with our readers. And I know um, whose tastes overlap with mine, whose recommendations I really put a lot of credence in. You know, and I have my book pals that just lead me to good stuff. You know, my friends I like to go walking and have coffee with, he'll be like, Anne, have you read this? And I know that our tastes overlap. So I want to find those. Also, I get lots of good recommendations from people whose tastes don't overlap with mine or not as much, including like some of my own team members from Modern Mrs. Darcy and What Should I Read Next? We all have very unique reading styles and we're all drawn to dramatically different genres. Like, I think I'm the only one on our team who really reads. Okay, this isn't entirely true, but I'm the one on our team who reads the most like literary fiction. I love what I call compulsively readable literary fiction, books that have plot that keep you turning the pages, but also are just gorgeously crafted. Like that is totally my jam. But everybody on our team has their own reading personalities that I know really well. And so to have Rex coming from a trusted source that also you might not have found on your own, those are really valuable to me personally, because they make my life better, but also invaluable for the work we're doing. But that is wonderful that you have a group that have separate and distinctive personalities with respect to books, because that way then you're not all recommending the same titles. Yes. And in fact, when we hire for, for our team, we often get apologetic notes in, in our initial like interview process that says, oh, I don't read the same books as Anne. And we say, don't apologize. Like that is wonderful. We're so like, Anne already reads like Anne. We don't need to duplicate that. Like bring it. Yeah, you don't need five more Anne's because you're like, I need people that are reading other things so that we all have different things we can be talking about and bringing to the table. Yes. So tell me, Anne, because I'm dying to know, do you ever DNF books? Oh my gosh. Are you? Yes, all the time. We do not say should a lot in our space. We want to help you make choices that, that feel right to you. And we're not going to boss you about what to do in your reading life. We are not book bossy. But this is one of the places where I might say, readers, if you are still compulsively reading to the end of a book because you started it and you feel like you owe it to the reader and you're just a firstborn daughter who doesn't quit things she started just to describe basically everyone on our team, we had a good life or we had a good laugh when we discovered that we were all firstborn daughters. That is hilarious. I am as well. I mean, because you work from home, you have to be self-directed. You have to be accountable to yourself. No one is going to crack the whip over you and make sure you get your work done, Cindy. You have to do it yourself. And yeah, I, I think it's not an accident that there are a lot of firstborn daughters in our space. I understand the compulsion to want to follow through and finish that book because that's what it feels like. It feels like a character issue. And it definitely did for me for a long time. But it's just not, it's not the best thing for your reading. Life. I've written about this a lot. A modern Mrs. Darcy, it's there. But I can tell you real quick, one, you really, you don't owe the author anything. If you're grown up, you're not in school anymore. I read a quote from John Irving that really got me thinking, like in 2005, 10, that said, grownups shouldn't finish books they're not enjoying. And I would tweak that. I think there are all kinds of reasons to read a book that you don't enjoy. Like some books that I have really despised have been excellent reading experiences and have led to some of the best book conversations I've ever had like that have shaped my work, but you shouldn't, and I am going to say shouldn't, like don't spend time with a book that's not worthwhile. If you're going to finish the book and go, well, there goes 12 hours of my life. I'll never get back. Like, what are you doing? Like you can do better. But when you're sticking it out with that book that you are not enjoying, that isn't right, that isn't right for you right now, that you're doing that with a very real cost. And that is the books you could be reading instead. Also, 
this isn't always the case, but sometimes, especially for young readers, if you don't want to read the book you're reading, then your reading life often stalls, sometimes just grinds to a halt completely. And we don't want that to happen. Sometimes a book can be perfectly good, but it's just not good for you right now. Or maybe a, like, for example, like I didn't want to read books about fathers dying after my father died. Like I, I picked up a book not long after and was like, oh, I didn't realize this was in the story. Hard pass for right now. Most people understand that. Like that helps people understand like, oh, there's a reason to not always feel like I have to finish a book. Or I picked up a book the other night that had been highly recommended by a trusted source. It was a memoir and quickly discovered that the protagonist was writing about, I knew she was writing about an illness. I didn't realize she was writing about a specific kind of cancer that one of my family members has experienced. And I was just like, no, I'm not ready to go. I might never be ready to go there. Like, I don't want to read that book. I definitely want, wasn't going to beat myself up about finishing all the books you start. I could talk about that forever, but <laughs> readers, I just ask you to consider putting it down instead. Or telling yourself, I'll come back, I'll write it on a list. I'll come back to it later and see if that's a better time. I agree with everything you said. It took me a long time, Ian, to want a DNF, but now I have no problem doing it. And for the various reasons you described, it wasn't the book for me, or it's about Alzheimer's, which my dad has, so I don't want to read about that. Or it's just, you know, not the right time. Whatever it is, I think that's exactly right, that it's better to go ahead and just put it down, whether I come back to it later or not. Yes. Cindy, thank you for being the model for firstborn daughters. We <laughs> can. That. We can let this go. We can do it. Well, what's on the horizon for the modern Mrs. Darcy? Ooh, okay. We have some ideas and are working on some things. And that's what I'm going to say about that. But right now, this is an interesting season for me because for the first time in many years, I'm not under contract to work on a book or a journal which means I can focus more on the business. So I actually love the metaphor my friend Kendra Adachi has given to her business sometimes. She says, it's like the Weasley house. You have this thing going, you just start like adding on rooms and weird places and it gets a little like off kilter, but it's working. I feel like when we are busy, busy, busy in our work, it's easy to just add on those rooms hodgepodge like it's the Weasley house. But right now we're in a season of working on the business more to free up the headspace and the calendar space when we um, finish making our tweaks. We do a big series of tweaks like once every year or two. But once we get everything just like humming along, it frees up so much creative energy so that we can think expansively and think like, okay, this is rock solid. Now we can dream big. That sounds a little bit cheesy. No, not at all. No. I, I think that's so true. Like when your systems are perfect or perfectly enough designed to support what you're doing, it really frees you up to focus on the creative stuff and not the logistics. And we love focusing on the creative stuff. Like I did say that ideas are easy. It's the implementation that is hard, but just working with a creative team and getting to brainstorm together and think about the possibilities and then turning those into reality is such a joy. And I'm excited about how we're going to get to try new stuff in 2023 and 2024. I love that analogy of the Weasley home, though, because I do find that if I don't take the ideas I have, sit with them for a little while, try to figure out, okay, how's that going to work? What's it going to look like? You know, instead, you're kind of just cobbling stuff together. But if you can take the time, really think through it, and then take some time to expand, things go a lot smoother and usually work out better. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, that's one of those very adult, kind of boring, not remotely sexy truths of adulthood. <laughs> that getting the basics right really makes everything so much better. I think that's true. Well, Anne, what have you read recently that you really liked? Oh, I've read so much good stuff. So you were at the fall book preview. So you heard me talk about how much I loved the new Barbara Kingsolver novel, Demon Copperhead. I always, it's a riff on David Copperfield and I often pull the wrong syllables. Like I call it Demon Copperfield. Copperfield, yeah. <laughs> Demon Copperhead coming in uh, late October. This was not the book I thought I wanted to read. I was like, Barbara, what are you doing to us with this Dickens stuff? But it was so good and just like hooked me from the beginning. I'm surprised how much I continue to think about a nonfiction book by Marissa G. Franco. It's called Platonic, How the Science of Attachment Can Help You Make and Keep Friends. I find that this book, which is about attachment theory in friendship, not romantic relationships, is making me see like many of the novels I'm reading differently. Like I just read Seven Days in June, which I know so many people have read already by Tia Williams, but we're doing an event together at a literary festival this fall. 
So I find it's been on my list forever and I finally had to read it now, but I kept thinking of platonic and it's not the first book I've been through um, since reading this nonfiction book that has made me see what's happening on the page in a slightly different way because I'm seeing these very human dynamics at work that Franco really broke down for us in this book. And I've read a couple of French novels I've loved recently, The Anomaly and Freshwater for Flowers, but I finally listened to the memoir. Becoming Duchess Goldblatt by Anonymous. The author is Anonymous, which a patron taught me into reading. I'm actually going to be doing a a bonus episode about it soon over there. So you'll hear that, Cindy. But it was just such an unexpected delight. I did not know what I was getting into. I knew very little going in and it was a joy with a lot of depth to it that made me think about platonic, but also such a joy. I love that book. Do you follow her on Twitter now? I followed her on Twitter for forever, and somehow I thought Becoming Duchess Goldblatt, I just didn't understand that it actually was a memoir. I thought it was a fake memoir. Oh, got it. Yeah. Yeah, I just didn't get it. I didn't get it. Now I do. It was so fun. Well, I love that book, and I love the two French books that you talked about. My book club read Freshwater for Flowers and loved it, and The Anomaly. Oh, my gosh, I could talk about that ending forever. <laughs> I just thought it was such a creative book. Well, Anne, this has been delightful. I can't thank you enough for joining me on the Thoughts from a Page podcast today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been such a delight to talk books with you, Cindy. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not. It's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because... The news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased, and essential world news daily. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I really appreciate your taking the time to listen to my podcast. I want to quickly share about this wonderful company I am now partnering with. I am always looking for entities that promote and highlight books and recently came across book clubs, a company who provides all sorts of resources for established and new book clubs, as well as individual readers. My own personal book club recently signed up on book clubs, and the group has been impressed with all of the great tools the site and app provide. The book club's website is linked in my show notes, and I hope you will check them out soon. Also, if you like my show, I would be so grateful if you would tell everyone you know about it and rate it on whichever platform you listen on. It truly makes a huge difference and really helps the show grow. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront, and that link is also in the show notes. I hope you will check out some other Thoughts from a Page episodes and have a great day. Welcome to Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and for each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together, we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. Our ninth season is coming this fall. Tune in to hear from some of the all-time great authors, Charles Dickens, Jules Verne, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and more. Subscribe to Novel Conversations wherever you listen to podcasts.